Good morning. Good morning. You say hi. So today I thought I would come to you guys and talk about how I created my own co-op. Uh, um, a co-op is a homeschool cooperative. That's what I'm referring to when I say that. And exactly what it costs, the amount of time I've put in, how to find one locally to you or how to start your own. Ups and downs of it as well as the blessings, and then talking about becoming a nonprofit and the amount of work that goes into that. So first, before we get started, I'm gonna share a little bit about our co-op. So my children have always been a part of a classical education co-op until last year. We moved and we realized what we were paying for really wasn't sufficient for the price that we were paying. And it was missing some things, key things that are important in education, like the love for fine arts and music appreciation, um, as well as some depth to the science that we were doing. So, so what I did is I took and I just started jotting down ideas. What is it that I disliked? What is it that I liked about the program we were in? And then that is where the start of it came. So the program that I created is K through 12. And in that program, we have history, art, math, science, geography, Greek, PE slash recess, depending on the grades that they're in. Oh, I know I'm forgetting something off the top of my head. Um, I said language arts. We have a grammar program for the older kids. And so that is where we're at with what we're learning. And we're doing it from a classical and Charlotte Mason viewpoint. Oh, yeah. The kids also do picture study, music study, um, poem memorization, hymn memorization, Bible verse memorization. I'm trying to think what else. All that kind of good stuff. Before I even started looking for families or finding us a place, the first thing I had to do was decide on a name. Okay, got our name. Then I had to write a set of bylaws. Now this was a more complicated thing, being in education as well as being a religious co-op, because we're a Christian co-op, you need to make sure that the things that are important to you are just clear to the families. Um, and to the IRS and all of that. So once you create your bylaws, which is quite complicated, what I suggest doing is looking for a bylaw format, um, following the format, inserting the points that are important for your cooperative. Um, that alone took me probably about 10 days and it's like 15 pages long, uh, but we have to cover all of our bases then is to form a board now something that still makes my mind like when you want to become a nonprofit, you need a board and those board members take a vote on things that are important and they meet regularly just to cover the fiscal side of things making sure you're being responsible keeping track of things um so it's not something that i'm used to having been a business owner and doing those things and always making the decisions on my own that's a little bit different so make sure you vet your board members you know like do they need to be homeschoolers do they need to have a background in finance do they need to have served on a board before and understand taking minutes all things to just be aware of but once you've done that then you can go ahead and either choose to start finding families like is this going to be a thing can we make a co-op out of this or you could just go forward with applying towards becoming a nonprofit. Now, I highly suggest using a CPA for this process. They know what they're doing. They know how to do all the paperwork. And that is what our co-op did, and we were very thankful for them. The process was relatively painful. Um, there are some fees involved that go to the IRS, and for us being in the state of California, um, as well as to them, and you're paying for many different things like licensing, employer verification, um, proving status of a non -op, uh, nonprofit, and then to the IRS, you pay like a really good chunk to apply to become a nonprofit. And for most people, that process takes between six and 18 months. Our stuff all went through very fast. And we're incredibly thankful. We, in about two months' time, got everything back, and we just or minds blown about that. Um, but once you have applied for those things, you can set up a bank account. Um, 
I did not apply for our nonprofit status right away. I waited to see, do we even have an interest in becoming a co-op? Well, it turns out that we did. We had a very large interest. We have, well, we started with 21 families, but a couple decided to not enroll. So we have 18 families for our first year, which is a large amount of people. And so we're very thankful that we are now an approved nonprofit. It changes things and it makes them very easy for us to be able to collect money, buy supplies, fundraise, all those things. Highly suggest becoming one if you're going to. It's very overwhelming the amount of information that you have to take and to become one. But that's why I think it's easiest to just use a professional that knows what they're doing and can help you get started, in my opinion. Not everybody is maybe, like, I don't love legal jargon um, or reading financial literature. Not my favorite thing to do. So someone who is naturally inclined to do those things, I'm like, you do it for us. You're 100% worth it. You're amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and so that's just my suggestion. And when you start collecting families and you're going to need things like information about the kids enrolled, you're going to need to type up waivers, releases of liability, um, agreements to maybe a statement of faith if you have one, or rules and regulations for your cooperative. And so I would suggest that you carefully think out and write down before you type the things that are important for you um, and to your co-op that you would want to see um, held true and to be consistent. Um, like we have probably six different pages families have to fill out and it's a lot but it's worth it because it covers who are your children emergency contacts birthdays allergies release of um liability from the building myself the co-op uh volunteers you know that you take responsibility as a parent so you have to think of all the things that you need to cover and once you have those done so once that is all set in stone and you give families paperwork, what I did is I held an information meeting. And so I put together a presentation with papers for them. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, now I'm talking. So I put together a presentation and papers for them, besides the paperwork they fill out, but just information. What will our school year look like? What are we, what are we doing like throughout the year? What will we be learning? We are a volunteer program, so we don't charge a tuition this year. Um, I wanted to make it as low cost as possible. <clears throat> families in our first year because we don't know what it's going to look like. As much as I have a plan and a vision, people will need to have grace and be willing to wiggle a little bit the first year as we get things that are important established. As you go forward and looking for what are we going to do? How are we going to set this up? Keep in mind that you have to decide, are you charging enrollment fees, tuition, and all that? We decided to forego that. Now, that would not be my advice because I learned if people don't have any financial stake in it, they will come and go like nobody's business. But those who are invested are willing to pay a little bit of money in order to keep going. Having kids, this, this video is kind of going all over the place. So I'm going to prop you guys up on the piano. Okay, Madeline, thank you. So what I'm suggesting to you guys is that you go ahead and decide what fees are you going to charge. Um, before, we've paid enrollment fees, contract fees, tuition fees, supply fees, building fees, insurance fees. So a lot. And for us, that just wasn't worth it to continue paying those things. I wanted all families of all financial backgrounds to have an opportunity. Madeline, can you wait to play the piano, please? Um, and so we, that's what we want with. Now, what I've learned is, like I said, if there is no financial stake in it for them, it's very easy for them to come and go. So I would suggest at least charging an application fee, definitely charge for your supplies, um, unless you have a really generous donor that's willing to pay for all of them. And then outside of that, there's going to be a lot of things that you need to determine how you're going to do. You know, are you going to have volunteer teachers? Are you going to have paid teachers? Is every family going to need to teach? So you'll have to decide what works for your co-op.
For us, every family to be enrolled is involved. Sorry, for every family that is enrolled, they must volunteer in one area of our co-op. And so they either need to be a teacher on the cleaning crew, do yearbook, plan our field trips, because me as the director, I am doing all of the things and making sure they all run as smoothly as possible with zero help. So having those committees helps me to make sure that everything's getting done. I have a second person looking at like, hey, did you know you forgot this because I'm human and have a lot of people and a lot of items I have to look after. So once you've decided what your program is going to look like, if you're going to be a fully paid program, you need to decide are we a drop-off program or do we require parents to stay on the property with them. Um, once you have all of these decisions made, you can look for a building. Now, the best suggestion that most people have is using buildings that are free. Um, like libraries, parks, community centers, churches, and so for us, we asked our own church that we attend if we could have our co-op there um, and their council voted on it and they agreed to have us there and they've been very gracious we have a bunch of classrooms an office and storage space um, pretty much literally everything you could dream of as having a co-op and so what i would suggest to you is that just go around talk with people and within your community and see now they may they may not all offer it to you for free we were very blessed and they did allow us to meet for free there and in turn we cleaned the buildings we you know just did some basic renovations and cleanup to make it fit for our community and feel great and new and ready for us so that is how we got started and then I planned, um, I used something called Band App and that is just where I can invite all the families in this private forum to discuss all things school related. Um, I also gave families a supply list and a schedule of things like here's when we're taking our yearbook photos, um, you know, here's all the field trips that we'll be taking for the first half of the year. And so that way they're aware of what's going on. Um, communication, I feel, is key. Others may not communicate back with you, but I feel it's really important, especially as someone who has like a leader, founder, um, you know, CEO, director position. You need to be on top of communicating with others, making your goals clear, um, or at least doing your best to do so. And you're going to upset people along the way. That's what I've learned. Um, inevitably, someone will be displeased with the way that you do things, but that's why you have those papers set in stone and those plans made where you've said, this is how we're gonna operate and there's not gonna be any exceptions. Now, if something happens that's out of the normal, which we have had happen, we need to go to our board and have them be aware and to take a vote on things. Um, and so, yeah, that's just how it works. But overall, so the the downside to owning a co-op is you make no money. <laughs> At least I don't because we're not charging tuition all that. Um, and you invest a lot of time. I have probably put in over 200 hours since I founded it to the point of getting started. And that's before the school year because there's so much to do, especially for us because we had a building and playground and all these things that needed to be cleaned and taken care of. So we put in a lot of hours, time, effort, money, energy out of my own pocket that has nothing to do with the co-op. So just be prepared for that if you are the person that decides to start one. Now, the benefit is, is that you get to help a ton of families have an enriched education. Um, and for us, it was really important that it's Christ honoring. And so we were able to do that. And I was able to have my kids in a program that fit the needs that we have for them. And that was such an amazing thing. And we would never exclude any family. So it's like anybody who wants to come and join, as long as they understand this is what we hold to, they are welcome there. And we've had so many families who are like, maybe not this year, maybe next year. Um... And things are just amazing. We've been very blessed by it. Um, it's been an encouragement to serve our community and have this program put together because there are not programs like what I've done everywhere. And so I'm just thankful, very thankful for all the people who are trusting me and coming and helping because so many of them have also selflessly served and given their time. And I'm very, very thankful for that. And many of them have donated products as well. My oldest is 
sitting here with me. Would you go get her a yogurt out of the garage? And so, those are some things to consider once you become a legit nonprofit. Um, well, even before you can take, you can take donations, um, and you have a paper donation form, and you want to make sure you keep track of your incoming and your outgoing. And so, if you collect a donation as a family, I mean as a co-op, you want to make sure you're keeping specific track. This person gave us this many items or this monetary donation um, and you always keep track of everything very specifically it's super important because you want to be accountable to the public to your cooperative to the IRS all those things and then financially if you have a need a cost that needs to be spent for the co-op you would make sure you know that hey we've spent X amount of money on this kept the receipt proved you got the item just to be extra on top of it, it really helps. And so hopefully this gives you a brief overview of what it means to get started as a co-op. Um, so much work, but in the long run, once it's established, you can go year after year after year and you could expand as much as you possibly wanted to. And so we are just so incredibly thankful for the opportunity and if you decide to start a co-op I would love to hear it in the comments share with me what you're doing what you're building um, ask questions if you have any and get your kids involved my kids were involved in a lot of the questions that I had do you guys like this do you not like that do you think other kids and so it really became a family program and they also helped put a lot of time put a lot of time and effort into getting our co-op started um, as well as just missing their mama a lot because we've had a lot of things like teacher training days and days where they just couldn't come with me while I'm putting stuff away or organizing donations. Um, when you seek donations, you know, it can be very simple. You could just put it out to the community or the public that you're looking for book donations or curriculum or playground or you guys need monetary donations. Today we'll be out fundraising for our co-op because we have a classroom that needs a portable AC because uh, it's hot in the summer still where we live when you're inside a building. And so we're going to go seek that and see if we can hopefully get a company to give us a donation, which would be such an incredible blessing. Um, but there's lots of avenues that you can take as a nonprofit that benefit you. If you're a for-profit co-op, which some people are, and they don't file a nonprofit, um, 501c3, there's a huge problem that lies with that. You may not use a church building or a library or a park or a community center um, for those things. You cannot be a for-profit business in those places because you could cause them to lose their tax-exempt status. Uh, and that's a really big deal and something to look into. There is a really wonderful um, CPA online. She's not who we used for our filing, but she, her name's Carol Top, and she talks a lot about the co-op world and the corruption of people going into these different places and not filing properly and the problems that it causes legally. And we should be doing our best to be accountable and be truthful um, and upfront with everything. But I would really suggest to just get over that hump and hurdle, get those filings done and do things right so that if a church building allows you to use their facility, you're golden. Um, it's very, very important. So that is all I have for you guys today. I hopefully will include some pictures throughout this of our community. And I hope that it's a blessing and encouragement to you guys to found something and establish something in your own community that benefits all families. We'll see you next time. Bye.